Robert Montgomery presents the American Tobacco Theater. Brought famous old London townhouse. They to toasted Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in this drawing room. Cabinet ministers, bankers, businessmen, the world famous have been guests here in the past. But in 1942, there appeared an unusual group of guests with an even more unusual host. To pass the time, this host has provided a collection of gramophone records, fine books, latest magazines, or a bracing cup of tea or the opportunity of a stroll in the garden. But the host decrees that this is as far as any guest may go. For this is one of the most closely guarded projects of the British intelligence during the Second World War. Thirteen years have passed, and now it can be told. In just one minute, The Cage, written by Paul Manning and Joseph Graham. But first, a message from the American Tobacco Company about one of their fine products. who entered this house in London, known as the Cage, were British officers with special credentials from MI5, and those refugees from the continent whose background and stories necessitated the closest screening by these specialists of British counterintelligence. The reasons for such security precautions were simple. In London, England, in the year 1942, any refugee might well be an enemy agent. In this period, espionage and counter-espionage was a deadly game between British and German spymasters, and the pawns were the men and women who infiltrated into each other's ranks. Amsterdam, that's where you will make contact with the group, and then, when you are with the Dutch forces in London, you will have freedom of movement. It is imperative that we know the effect of our U-boat attacks, production figures, the organization and build-up of the American army in England. From time to time, you will receive specific instructions. All your information is to be transmitted through your immediate superior, Arthur Morley. The Dutch underground follows the usual pattern. Within a week, you will sail from London, from Amsterdam, and within two days, arrive in London. Düsseldorf again. There are so many. Where do they come from? Production figures. British production figures on bombers. Which factories? That is your first assignment. Why do we wait? There's one more to come. Who? You know better than to ask a question like that. Why not? Suppose the Gestapo were to make it walking now. If you want the other one caught. They'd get it out of us, believe me. She's right, Van der Boer. The less you know, the better. It 
It's getting late. The Germans double their patrols between midnight and dawn. You seem to know a lot about the way the Germans operate. I do. I was a guide until two of my units were picked up. I've been hiding for a week. I'm no longer useful here, so now I join my husband. Your husband? Two years he's been with the Free Dutch Forces in England. He's leaving his wife here. I can't wait any longer. It is time to tell you. You are leaving by boat. I will be your guide to the North Sea. So you are on the boot point. In case there is any trouble, if I fire, you will escape as quickly as possible through the door. Over there in the corner, it leads to the back of the house. Up for I'm very much alive, my dear. I'm very sorry that I'm so late, but the streets are full of German soldiers. I have to ask each of you to help carry petrol for the boat. <laughs> You're escaping with the same petrol that got you into trouble with the Gestapo. <laughs> You will make yourself as comfortable as possible here. This is our son's bedroom. Your son? Where is he? My son is with the Free Dutch Forces in England. Perhaps you will meet him. Here are clean blankets, but I'm afraid that some of you will have to sleep on the floor. Some reading to help pass the time, and here is a chart of the North Sea. You will want to study it. How long are we expected to stay here? I can't answer that. Everything will be ready tonight. Then you must wait. <laughs> wait for what? The weather. You will need fog to slip past the German patrols. Oh, yes, the radio. You can listen to the news. It is tuned for the Radio Orange broadcast of the BBC, but you must be careful to keep this knob on the mark. It's the volume. It would be dangerous if it should be loud as you turn the set on. This is a well-built house. The floors are solid, so it is perfectly all right to move around and to speak in normal voices. And to everyone in this town, this is just the storage room now. Your petrol and your provisions are being put aboard your boat. It is very small. I forgot to mention, the next house is requisitioned as a German naval barracks. I'm afraid they will play their gramophone at all hours. I prepared some food and I will bring it now for you.
88 kilometers. If they could fly. It looks like such a short way. Our problem is not to use up our pet bulls zigzagging through the minefields or dodging e bolts Think we have enough? That depends. The North Sea is always rough. I wish I had time to bring more. How did you manage to get this much? I was fortunate enough to be working for the ministry. I have news. There is a heavy fog rolling in off the sea. You will leave in the morning. Here's the TWX on the Frenchman. Yes. Well, that seems to check him out. Is that the last of this batch? Yes, sir. Good morning, Colonel. Evan. Major? Oh, what brings you over from Whitehall? Jerry's latest toy. Huh? Should cause you boys some sleepless nights. Oh, what is it? What does it look like, Colonel? Well, I can see it's a microscopic slide. And what do you see on it? It's like a spot of dirt. Have a look, Evans. Well? Well, it's round, like a dot. Not bad, old man. That's Jerry's code for it. Punct. Dot. He's put a message on it, small enough to fit over the period mark on an ordinary typewritten letter. What, there's a message there? Put it on your projector. Well, let's have a look. Odd how we found the first of these. One of our lab chaps ran across it. He was treating a letter for some hidden writing. <laughs> Didn't find any writing, but he found this. And he was clever enough to put it under a microscope. There it is. Yes, I wonder how many of those have slipped through us. Have our fellows broken it down? Oh, yes, it's just one of these standard German codes. As a matter of fact, the message affects you. It translates, Arthur Morley, care of post office box 7 Clapham. Dutch agent arriving by sea. Get in touch with you. Recognition code, Achtung auf den Punkt. Signed, Zugler. <laughs> Friend Zugler, eh? Who is this Morley? I wish we knew. This was just a routine interception of a letter from a Swedish business firm. We haven't caught up with Mr. Morley yet. He hasn't tried to find his mail. Morley? Arthur Morley. Come in. This just arrived, Colonel. Oh, uh, five by sea, from Holland. They've just been sighted. Look, over there. Good, it is a British ship. They will pick us up. Come on, they. Due to the routine interception of a coded message in the laboratories of MI5, the small group who fled Holland now find themselves unwilling guests, and already the strain seems to be telling on one of them. How long will they keep us here? Well, who knows? This place is a prison. They've taken away our clothes and given us uniforms, if you can call them that. Soldiers at the door. Soldiers out there. Barbed wire. But no Gestapo. Remember, we did come from an occupied country. Much as I hate to say it, there were traitors in Holland. But three days in an open boat. We risked our lives to get away from the Germans. And we would have died if we had stayed. According to those records, all had pretty sound reasons for mm -hmm. wanting to leave Holland. It'll be interesting to see which one is lying. Well, of course, the arrival of this group may be coincidental. Have the originals of these all been sent over for a handwriting analysis? Yes, sir. I also sent a bottle labeled medicine, which we found in the effects of that Vanderbilt chaps. We should be getting an answer from the lab any time now. 
Their other belongings? Negative, sir. Evans, what do our records show? What percentage of those leaving Holland by boat ever get through? Well, about 10%, sir. Exactly. Now, looking through these stories, doesn't it strike you as odd that none of this group either sighted the enemy or an evil? Come in. Find anything? No, sir. Have their clothes cleaned and returned to them? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if you was to ask me, I'd have no trouble picking out the one. You wouldn't? Like that one in there, him with the little moustache. He's got something to hide, he has. Jumpy, all the time, pulling on his ear. I'll bet you, he's your man. How about five bob? You're on. The Colonel would like to speak to Hilda Nunn. Yes. Uh, before you take her in, give these to Lieutenant Van Cleve. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Henry Rosendahl, will you come with me, please? Won't you sit down, Mr. Rosendahl? Uh, would you be kind enough to take a look at those, please? Mr. Rosendahl, will you kindly tell me exactly who are these people that you mentioned in your statement? Why? Hilda Narden. Will you follow me, please? Just a moment. Right, come in. Ah, good morning, Mrs. Norton. Come in, won't you? Sit down. I hope you don't find this clothing too uncomfortable. Your own's being cleaned. You'll have it back tomorrow. I understand. Now, I have your written statement here, but I'd be pleased if you just uh, check some of the information for me. Your full name, please? Hilda Norton. Age? 28. Place of birth? Zandam, Holland. Have you lived there all your life? Until I was 12. It's just outside Amsterdam. Yes, I know. You're married? Oh, yes. My husband... He's with the Free Dutch Forces here. Yes. We're getting in touch with him. When may I see him? Oh, very soon, I hope. Your mother's name? Uh, my mother and father are dead. Their names? Elsa and Peter de Hort. Have you any others in your immediate family? I had... I have a brother, Peter. How old is he? Twenty-six, two years younger. Where is he? I do not know. He was at the university when the Nazis came. We haven't heard from him since. I was hoping he might be here often. This is not. Have you at any time been a member of any political society or union? No. That is except for the underground. Now, will you please tell me in your own words exactly what you did for the underground? I was a passeur, a guide for those who had to escape. We helped many of your airmen. See, after the Nazis came, there was much confusion. A group of friends used to meet at our house and talk about what must be done. At first, we made mistakes. After a while, fortunately, I was able to get away just in time. At the time, I didn't think it was possible to escape. Everything seemed against it. But. Then I got the help I needed just in time. It's really not very difficult to understand why my friends thought that I was dead. After all, a man in my position being hunted by the Gestapo, then he disappears. Would you mind telling me again, Mr. Rosendahl, exactly what was your official position? I was uh, a Gemeinte Ratzner. 
That is, you would say, a member of the town council. Well, wasn't that a rather difficult office to hold without the cooperation of the Germans? Impossible. But uh, I pretended to cooperate with them. Then one day a friend of mine warned me that I was under suspicion. He telephoned me at my home, at my office. I never went home. Where did you go? Why, I... Friends took me in. Who were these friends? Why, I... Uh... I think you can speak freely here. Wilhelm North and his wife. They have a small hotel in Zandam. The address? 37 Kijkstraat. How long were you there? Six days. They arranged for my escape. Well, I see it's almost time for dinner. You may go now. There's nothing else that I can tell you? Not today, thank you very much. Recording. All through one, two. Hmm? Well, I've just had quite a session with John Lupins. He's an interesting fellow. How did you make out, Evans? Henrik Rosendahl has an answer for everything. Here's a copy of a query I sent Dutch intelligence. Oh, who are these? People are supposed to have helped him. He was away from all known contacts for almost a week before they left. He could have been thoroughly briefed by Zugler in that time. Yes? Yes, send him in. Well, pin him down to streets travel, the exact time of day, what he ate, anything special, such as our planes passing overhead. We can get in touch with the RAF about their activities during that period. Keep on making him repeat the minor details. We'll see if he slips. Starting to rain again. Had our handwriting boys on these all day. All sample studies indicate that the subjects learnt their handwriting in Dutch schools. Well, that bears out our opinion. They're all Dutch nationals. What about the medicine bottle? Oh, that? Common pepsin compound. Calms the stomach. Your professor must have had an ulcer. Well, that could account for it. Armour says that he's nervous and irritable. I see. Speaking of ulcers, you chaps haven't eaten yet, have you? Well, I've got a great deal to do. I must be back early. How about you, Evans? Thank you, sir. I'll get my coat. Good. Of course, Mrs. Narden. What is it? My husband. Is it possible to talk with to him on the telephone? I'm sorry. Mrs. Narden. I'll be talking to your husband on the telephone tomorrow. I'll tell him that you're here and well. Thank you. Very much. Another day. They're all the same. Three days of this. Question after question. What do they want of us? I don't know. I'm tired. They have their reasons. The food is good. The food? <laughs> How can I enjoy it? My stomach is upset all the time. I would say from all these reports, we can now eliminate the Narden woman. I think I could say the same about Hans Ostermann, sir. Well, have another go at him today. I want you to bear down on Rosendahl and Ostermann. Evans, the same thing goes for you and Vanderbilt. I'll work on Luton's. John Luton's. Hey. 
Henrik Rosendahl, Eric van der Voort. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl, you will go with Lieutenant Van Cleve. Mr. Van der Voort, you will follow me, please. Now, Mr. Lukens, please tell me again how you obtained your job at the Ministry of the Interior. I needed work. I, I went to the Ministry of Labor. They sent me. Who sent you? The Ministry of Labor. A clerk? Yes. What was his name? I don't remember. Whose idea was it to provide petrol for the underground? Well, I, I wanted to help. Who was your contact for the underground? A man called Coonrod. His last name? I never knew. When did you first meet him? November 12th. Last November 12th. Now, Mr. Lucas, before you went to the work for the Ministry, there's a period of three months when you were away from Amsterdam. I was working on my cousin's farm. Oh, where's that? Near Vormavirs, north of Amsterdam. Did any of this group know you at that time? No. What was the name of your superior at the Ministry? Kurt Sieden. He was replaced by a German officer, Lieutenant Vetter. Yes, that's what you've already told me, Mr. Vandevoort, but are you certain about the time? How can you be so sure when it was so long ago? It was eight o'clock. How can you be so certain? I just remember, that's all. Ludwig told me that the Gestapo were to pick me up that night. And how did he know? I didn't ask. I just packed a bag and slipped out. I went to Zandam, where I had a contact with the underground. What time did you get there? Uh, in the morning. And the time? Uh, eight or, or maybe eight thirty. How did you travel? I had a bicycle. What route did you take? The canal road. And it took you twelve hours or better? I... Uh, I had to stop and, and get off the road for the German patrols. I had no travel permit. Who was your contact with the underground? A man named Reistar. Where did you meet him? I had known him before the war. Dates, places, names. Repetition and attention to the obscure detail. The British technique of breaking down the enemy agent. A trained agent will always remember the obvious, but sometimes he will contradict himself on a minor point. The question questioner watches closely for telltale signs that he is scoring in this match of wits. The twitch of an eyelid, the sudden change in rhythm of breathing. The clever agent is an actor. So also is the examiner. His outward mood may shift from kindness to anger. With the same rapidi rapidity that his questions may shift from the important to the insignificant. But always underneath he must remain cool and detached. Always searching for the key which will unlock the fabricated story with which the agent has cloaked himself. Dates, places, names. Dates, more places and more names. I told you, I don't remember. You mean you don't remember the man who gave you a job when you needed it? You can't even remember what he looked like? I can't remember. You look tired, Mr. Lukens. That will be all for today. I 
I would like to go to the dormitory to rest. Thank you. Just mark my words, he's the one. <laughs> Won't be long before you'll have to shell out five bob. Shell out? I've already spent your money. <laughs> Well, sir, that pretty well eliminates three. Yes, the Narden woman, Osterman, and with Dr. Gordon's report, Vanderbilt. I can't conceive of Zugler sending here an agent with a peptic ulcer. He's nervous, irritable. He certainly made no effort to ingratiate himself. I've never run across an agent yet who didn't try to make the best impression possible. So that leaves two. Rosenthal. He seemed weak before he left. I can't pin it down. The hotel is there, we know that. But there's no check on the people who he says hit him. And he was accepted by the Germans as a member of the local town council. And then there's Lutons. There are a couple of things that bother me. First of all, <coughs> there's a gap of three months when we have only his word for where he was. And then his job at the ministry. Those are usually reserved for the favoured few. And yet, at the same time, both were members of underground units. Gentlemen, here is what you're looking for. These are recordings made from conversations picked up from your dormitories at night. Conversations of Rosendahl and Jan Lutens and their native tongues. An analysis has been made by Dr. Lott, former head of the speech department, University of The Hague. You were right. The professor says you can move five miles in Holland and the dialect changes. And number two is Rosendahl. It is unlofted that we are at trade darkens in. The professor says, speech of subject shows strong characteristics of the general Amsterdam area. However, certain inflections suggest a rural influence of the surrounding area. No foreign inflections or influence apparent. Bullseye. The Zandam is approximately 15 kilometers from Amsterdam. Well, now then, let's have um, number five, Jan Luton. Ik ben voortdurend echt bezorgd over mijn vrouw. Ik hoop maar dat de Duitsers het niet te erg met maar maken. Subject speech confusing. General characteristics indicate residence in the Amsterdam area. However, certain pronunciations and inflections would indicate speech influenced by periods spent in southwestern Holland. General Rotterdam Hague area. Oh, we may be onto something there. I've probed his life for the last four days, and this is the first mention I've had of Rotterdam or the Hague. This may give us something to work on tomorrow. I keep thinking maybe he's out there someplace. Your husband? Got a town said he talked to him on the telephone. I 
Achilles to wear his power parts when I was still in Holland. Who knows? It may be today. They've asked every possible question. They must be tired too. Jan Lund. My mistake. Come in, Miss Luton. Good morning. Sit down, will you? Thank you. Now, Mr. Luton, you said that your last delivery of petrol to the underground was just before a German officer took charge of the depot. Yeah, that is right. Before you worked for the Ministry, where did you say you were? I was working on my cousin's farm. Yes, we haven't been able to verify that. Perhaps not, but my cousin has a farm. What was the date of your arrival at the farm? The first week in August. Oh, how do you remember that so clearly? I was a shipping clerk. I lost my position when the Germans closed us down the last of July. How could I forget? The day before yesterday, in answer to the same question, you said that you arrived on the farm sometime after the middle of August. Oh? Well, I must have been confused. So many questions. I, I meant to say the first week. Now, which was it? Uh, the first week. And when did you return to Amsterdam? On November 3rd, I started to work at the Ministry on the 5th. Yes, that checks. Then, for three months, you were in Rotterdam. No, I was working on my cousin's farm. Or was it The Hague? No. Or perhaps somewhere in between. The course of German espionage at Zogfield is three months. German espionage? Zogfield? You didn't intend to say the first week in August because that coincided with the start of your training. But that's not true. And when your training was over, the Germans planted you in the Ministry of the Interior. That was on the 5th of November, right? I started and November 5th. they told 5th. you to get in touch with the underground, offered to provide them with petrol. They made it easy for you, didn't they? That's not true. And when you had gained the confidence of the underground, your German friends carefully spread the report that you were in trouble with the Gestapo. And the underground believed you. They got you out of Holland. Now, Mr. Lutens, just exactly what is your mission in England? I, I have no mission. I'm not a spy. Believe me. How can I believe you? I have the information right here that you were in Rotterdam. Well? I should have known better. I had no idea you could be so terrible. I was in Rotterdam. I know. But not like you have said. Colonel Townsend, no one likes to admit his mistakes. And I made a mistake. I was in Rotterdam, yes. But I was in prison there. Prison? That's right. I was in prison there. Well, perhaps you better tell me all about it. When the Germans closed us down, I, I went to Rotterdam. I, I thought surely I could find work there. But everything was very upset. My money was soon exhausted. And then one night, I, I broke into the house of an elderly couple who would help me. They were so good to me. I took whatever money they had, and I, I ran out. And then the next morning, the police... He, I was in Rotterdam. I was in prison there. You can understand why I did not wish to tell you. I'm sorry. We all make mistakes, I know. I'm so ashamed. Yes, I can understand that. Well, I think that will be all for now. Colonel, please, I hope you will not find it necessary to tell the others. I'm, I'm so ashamed. I'll do what I can. But if you told me the truth from the start, however, it would save us both a great deal of time and trouble. I'm very sorry, Colonel, very sorry. Well, that's all right. All right, you can go now. Well, 
you hear it? He's run for his cover story. Sounds vaguely familiar. The last fellow Zugler sent over here was carrying British pounds. When we broke him down to his cover story, he said that he'd robbed a church and sold a chalice to a black marketeer. How can we prove he's lying? Find somebody who can testify he wasn't in that Rotterdam prison. Well, we may not have to. It might be enough to make him think that we have such a person. Suppose we were to show him a TWX form in code with a decoded copy attached, stating definitely that he never was in the prison, signed by a fictitious name. He wouldn't believe it, sir. Oh, but suppose he were to see it accidentally. Accidentally? Yes. It might give him a bit of a shock. Yes, it might. We'd have to make it look authentic. We shall have to make up our own code. I want it printed on the machine to look official. And uh, ask Major Sanders to be here at four o'clock. Tell him to bring along that latest Jerry thing. You know, the uh, dot affair, the slide. Let's do this up properly. <laughs> Thank you, no. Mr. Luton, will you follow me, please? Oh, I'm working in here this morning. Captain Evans is using my offerings for a conference. Sit down with you, Mr. Lubbins. Thank you, Colonel. Now, Mr. Lubbins, I'm disappointed in you. The Colonel, why? Well, first of all, you tell me that you spent three months on your cousin's farm in the north of Holland. Then you contradict this story and say that you were in Rotterdam prison during that time. Isn't that right? Yes. Mr. Lubbins. You're a liar. The Colonel, I... Mr. Luton, you're a liar and I can prove it. I have the proof right here. Yes, Colonel Tarrant here. What? Oh. Yes, all right, I'll come in. Yes. Stay here, will you, Mr. Luton? I'll be back in a few moments. wondering if he dare chance it. He's got to chance it. He must know what's in it, and he doesn't dare be caught reading it. Now, Mr. Lukens, we were discussing your inability to tell a straightforward story. Of course, we could continue the discussion indefinitely, but why should we? Wie geht's, mein Freund, Herrn Zügler? That's German. But you understand it? Yes. Then answer it. Uh, Herr Zügler? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know Herr Zügler. Nonsense. You must have seen him during the last fortnight. No. Come with me, will you? I have a surprise for you. Way into my office. Mr. Lukens, this is Major Sanders of our military intelligence. 
Tell me again, what was that you were telling me this morning, Saunders? Oh, about uh, Arthur Morley. You know who Morley is, don't you? Well, it may interest you to know that Major Saunders' men picked him up this morning. Cleve, you might show Mr. Lukens what else Major Saunders found this morning. Yes, sir. Come over here. Sit down. Right, Saunders. Oh, it's one of the standard German codes. It translates Arthur Morley, care of Post Office Box 7, Clapham. Dutch agent Jan Lutens arriving by sea. Get in touch with you. Recognition code, Achtung auf den Punkt. Zugler. Well? Stupid swine. To include my name. You admit then that you came here as a German agent. Proud of it. I only regret I accomplished nothing. All right, take him away. Corporal? Yes, sir. Take this man into custody. Sergeant, detail two men as guards. They will accompany Major Sanders to the home office. Yes, sir. By the way, Sarge, if you've got a free arm, I'll take my five bob. I'll pay you on Friday. Well, don't you forget it. I didn't forget the last time, did I? <laughs> I wish it were true about our having Arthur Morley. Well, his name proved useful at any rate. Evans, you might ring up Dutch headquarters and arrange for our friends to go back tonight. Yes, sir. All except the Narden woman. Her husband's waiting for her at the Connaught Hotel. You can take her over in my car. Yes, sir. Hello, Colonel Towns here. Yes? When? All right. Well, here we go again. Another group. Three of them this time, sighted in the English Channel. They'll be here tonight. This is Sandy Becker. The story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with any actual persons living or dead is intended or should be inferred. America's leading manufacturer of cigarettes. This has been a Robert Montgomery production.